Tonight on the Power Scripting Podcast, we are pleased to have with us Pat Richard. Welcome, Pat, to the show. Thanks. Thanks for having me on. No problem. So um, I know that you're a, a link MVP or collaboration mm-hmm. MVP. I'll, I'll have you tell us exactly what all that stuff is. But before we get there, why don't you tell us a little bit about yourself? Um, go back to how you got started in IT. Um, hmm, okay. Um, well, I started out, I was working at a Radio Shack store, and I found myself awesome. constant, constantly standing in front of um, the TRS-80s and, and all those you know, ancient uh, uh, computers and just uh, really uh, interested in how they worked and you know, what made them tick. And I became kind of the go-to guy for you know, customers that were uh, crazy enough to come in and spend a boatload of money on a machine that didn't really do anything. And, um, you know, it just kind of started from there. I, you know, I found myself, uh, you know, answering questions on the outside and then uh, eventually um, went to a company called uh, National Tech Team and worked on a project for HP. They're supporting um, their pavilion PCs um, on the day that uh, Windows 95 was released. And so, you know, kind of thrown into the deep end where, you know, uh, the consumers really started to embrace uh, the PC in the home and uh, and plus the new OS and everything. So uh, started uh, working on that for a while, and then um, from there went over to EDS. I was at EDS during the whole Y2K thing, and and some of their um, migration from uh, 14 different email systems to Microsoft Exchange. Uh, I was doing some consulting on the outside for uh, so for small e- email systems. Stop and there stuff. for a second. 14 sure. different email systems. Were were they things aside from Exchange? Yes, so it was 14 non-exchange solutions throughout EDS, uh, and they were all migrated into uh, Exchange. So you you name it, and and they had it. And, wow, um, 14, so, I can't even name 14 other emails. <laughs> yeah, it was it was some really some really archaic stuff, and you know, of course, the usual notes and uh, group wise and 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 all that stuff, but. Um, um, that was fun, you know. That's where, where I really, really started to get deep into uh, email. Uh, I ended up being uh, an Exchange MVP for uh, six years before uh, kind of coming over to the dark side with Link, and I've uh, been a Link MVP for uh, two years now. Okay, cool. So, where do you work now? Did I miss that part? Nope. So now I am at uh, Modality Systems. Um, we pretty much only do Link, uh, and we're very good at it. So we're uh, one of the bigger partners uh, of Microsoft in the UC space, and uh, we're a, a global company with uh, uh, staff on three different continents. And um, you know, we're taking the the Link world by storm. Awesome. So so y'all pretty much. I mean, unified communications. That is what you do. Yes. Yep, mainly focused on Link. We don't even really do uh, Exchange too much other than the integration with the, the um, voicemail and, and related pieces that, uh, that Link uses. Um, so we don't, we're not an Exchange shop, we're a Link shop. Gotcha. So um, what does this space look like, I mean, and, and how has that changed over time? I mean, Link is one of Microsoft's, um, it's one of the newest enterprise products, isn't it, of, of theirs? Trying to think of what's yeah, it's, it's it's definitely had some some phenomenal success, especially in the last year or so, where companies are are really starting to trust um, you know a Microsoft solution for telephony, uh, audio and video conferencing and stuff like that. You know, um, competing against um, Cisco and and Avaya and shops like that. Um, you know, a lot more companies are are putting all their eggs in one basket and tying um, you know all their unified communications together with the Microsoft stack, with Exchange and with um, with Link, and also with, you know, some ancillary things like SharePoint. So, um, you know, we've seen a lot of a lot of growth um, in the last year, especially around voice. And, of course, Link can do so much more than just, uh, uh, just voice. It does, you know, instant messaging and presence and audio and video conferencing and collaboration and, you know, app and desktop sharing and, and all these different things. So... It's, it's yeah, a pretty, so good, good net pretty good suite. Uh, yeah, but net meeting's not around <laughs> anymore. <laughs> um, Look, conf.exe, that was what we used and we liked it. Yeah, yeah, the good old days. So now, you know, it's kind of all rolled in and, you know, lots of different um, 
lots of different features. Uh, it, it's a fairly complex solution. You know, it's uh, I equate it very similar to uh, Exchange in that, yeah, it's it can do one thing, but it can do a, a bazillion other things too. And and it's all in how you kind of exploit that solution uh, for your organization. Yeah, and and that um, I'm glad you. Um, mentioned that word about about complexity and, and compare it to exchange because that was that was my first impression when I played with it and I I didn't I never had hands on but um, a, a peer of mine was looking to deploy Link back in, back at the time this was probably mm, I don't know probably most of three years ago now and uh, yeah I just remember it seemed like it was it required more work more servers for the job that we expected of it um, now. Microsoft has to think about things like scaling um, that, that maybe, yes. you know, a, a small company product, you know, maybe it'll work fine for 50 people, you know, 100 people, and it's, it's easy. But why don't you kind of um, lay that architecture out for us? Well, right. I mean, there's, you know, we, we, we do hear some pushback when we start talking about the number of servers required to, to do a deployment in Link. And it, and it all comes down in... in what the organization wants to accomplish, how the organization is laid out. You know, is it uh, 50 people in one office or is it 50,000 people in 200 offices? And, you know, what do they want Link to do? Do they just want instant messaging presence? Do they want just internal audio and video conferencing? Do they want dial-in conferencing? Do they want full enterprise voice where Link is your phone system? Um, you know, do you want to talk to other companies, you know, through Federation? Do you want to talk to Skype? Do you want to do, you know, all these different things? You know, that starts adding up. And then you, you have to look at, you know, what is your disaster recovery requirements? What are your high availability requirements? Um, you, you definitely start to see, you know, what we call server sprawl. Um, but the nice thing is, is that it scales phenomenally well. You bolt on another server and, and poof, you've got extra uh, capacity for your front end or for your edge where you're talking to the outside world. Um, it, it scales really well. But yeah, there, there's, there's quite a few uh, servers uh, involved. And, you know, sometimes so give, that, it, give us a, a scope of some of the scale, um, you know, like a small, a medium, and a large or something like that. And how many servers doing what different roles uh, to give us an idea. Well, it, of course, you can also do the cloud solution where you do Office 365, and you can sure. you, okay. you can use that for for a lot of the features. You can't really use it with voice. Um, there are some third party solutions out there that kind of bolt on uh, voice to Office 365. But if you want to do true enterprise voice, then you're looking at an on-prem deployment. <clears throat> if if you're a small shop, 50 people, and you just want to have instant messaging throughout the organization, you can get away with one server. Um, okay. It's 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 real easy. Just a standard edition server. You know the SQL databases are all on that server, um, and it can pretty much um, do anything that you want. Of course, with one server, that's a single point of failure. Um, you don't have um, any disaster recovery or high availability. Um, you don't have the ability to talk to other organizations through what we call federation. Um, but for internal communications, it's a fabulous solution. Um, if you want to talk to the outside world, then you're going to add another server that sits in your perimeter network called uh, an edge server. And that allows you uh, a couple of things. You can talk to other organizations. Um, you can federate with uh, things like Skype. Previously, you could talk to AOL and, and uh, Yahoo, but that ended at the end of last month. Um, but also, Does anybody it allows... Care? <laughs> well, my mom cares because she can't send me instant messages anymore, but... <laughs> Um, I, I ran a report for our organization, and, and really, that, those were the only communications org-wide was, you know, my mom sending me, you know, <laughs> happy, ber happy birthday notes. But, um, but um, you, know, you know, just as important is an edge server gives you the, uh, the ability to have your users outside of your corporate network connect to that same link infrastructure and be able to instant message and have audio and video calls with internal employees. Um, now, if you want to do things like uh, some advanced uh, presentations with PowerPoint, uh, then you're bringing in an Outlook web app server, which is uh, technically a wait, SharePoint wait a component. Hold, hold on for just a second. I'm sorry. Yep. What do you mean by advanced presentations with PowerPoint? If, if I say a word to you that, that is the competition, t tell me if this is what you mean. WebEx? Well, no, there's a, there's a difference because 
Okay. In Link, you can do application sharing. So I can share any application on my screen, and everybody in that conference can see it. Um, and that includes PowerPoint. So I could share it. You would see the entire PowerPoint application. Or I can present that PowerPoint, as, and you only see the slides, like a true presentation. And that requires uh, an Office web app server. And what that does is it essentially takes that information and converts it to HTML and sends it out over HTTP, which is far more um, efficient than application sharing, which tends to use like the RDP protocol, which is a little more bandwidth heavy. Mm -hmm. um, so it's, it's a lot more efficient, but it's a separate server role. So now we have you know, your, your internal front end server, you have your edge server, which is, gives you your remote access and external access, and now you have an office web app server. Um, you can complicate that things by, by scaling those out for high availability, in which case you, know, you have two or more of each one of those things. Um, if you have uh, multiple data centers where you want to have you know, half your organization um, uh, connecting to a data center in the US and half connecting to a data center in Europe, then you're going to duplicate that infrastructure um, in that data center as well. Um, you can have disaster recovery, so you know you lose an entire data center. You can um, you can fail over to to say the European data center, um, but you can add other things too, like uh, persistent chat. And persistent chat is think of it as uh, dedicated chat rooms where you can have a chat room yeah, for a specific that subject. Stuff is good. Yes, I love it. I am a huge fan of uh, persistent chat or p chat as as I call it. Um, because you can set it up for all kinds of alerts. You know, somebody goes into a chat room and says, you know, types the word link. Well, you know, I get a pop-up on my screen, and I can, I can, you know, click a link and, and jump into that chat room and, and you know, see what's going on with that. Or, you know, or um, have all these different chat rooms dedicated to different things like sales and development and things like that. Um, that takes a, a dedicated server. Um, and can you do that you, particular feature with Office 365? Uh, I don't think so. Um, hmm. That's kind of lagging behind. And Microsoft's making a big push for Yammer as you know, kind of a substitution. Um, I'm uh, I, I'm a little mixed on that. I'm, I prefer Persistent Chat better because it keeps you within the same client. You use the link client for everything then, um, versus Yammer where you don't have. Um, you don't have any connectivity with instant messaging within Link. It's you know completely separate. You can use email or a web browser or anything, but it's it's a it's a separate yeah uh, so a separate let's, client. Let's, let's get your let's dig into this and get your opinion because I, I see a similar um, type of friction um, where I work, and I'm, I'm I'm sure you can imagine this and see this uh, yourself. Um, Yammer to me seems like a solution looking for a problem in a fashion that professionals are typically, not everything, but typically they're not used to communicating in that way, and they don't actually want to. That's my impression. What do you think? Um, yeah, I, I think it, you're right. It's, it's a solution for a problem we don't have um, in most cases. But a lot of people, you know, the younger crowd, they're used to things like Facebook, and Yammer is very Facebook-ish, um, mm -hmm. if I can say that. Um, it, it, it takes it away from email, which I'm, I'm all for, you know, um, I think a lot of conversations are best in, you know, a forum setting or a, a threaded uh, conversation like like Yammer. Um, yes. But I still I still think that if if that conversation was in Link, you, you might get a little bit more of it. On the flip side, I think it's a little easier in Yammer to go through and see historical data than it is in uh, persistent chat. Uh, you know, yeah. in persistent chat, you can go into a room and, you know, one of the nice things is you can see everything that's gone on um, in that room since, you know, the, the day it was created, which is nice. It's perfect for, like, support groups, like organizations that have, uh, say, Follow the Sun uh, support where you have, you know, a, um, uh, a U.S. group, and I have to apologize, there's some fireworks going off outside my window here, but... Um, <laughs> You know, you have a you have a U.S. support group, and they discuss problems in this this persistent chat room uh, throughout the day. And then, you know, at the end of their day, then say the the um, the APAC group comes on, they can look in that same chat room and kind of see what happened throughout the day and, and get up to get up to speed. I think that's a, a perfect um, uh, use scenario for uh, persistent chat. Um, 
We use at Modality Systems, we, we use Yammer a lot. We do have persistent chat, but it doesn't get really used a lot. Um, Yammer get you, gets used. We have different topic areas for, you know, PowerShell and development and consulting and support and things like that. And it works really good because you can attach uh, links and pictures and files. Um, so it, it has its place, but I'm, I'm a diehard link guy. I like persistent chat. I like the unified um, uh, client aspect of it. Yeah, and and I've got some, I've got some love hate issues and some some feelings about like like what content ought to go where, and I'm I'm totally with you on the um, get it out of email part um, because even even the best um, ev mailing lists even if they're archived on the server it's not the same when you want to refer to that information later, um, and right. if you are you know like if you've got a group of technical folks that need to share technical detail. If you're if you don't have the ability to quickly easily refer back to historical knowledge, then they're just going to ask again. So you right. have this kind of cycle where people are asking stu I'm going to say stupid questions, but I don't actually mean stupid questions. But they're they're going to ask the same questions over and over again. Um, yes. So there's this like uh, institutional knowledge that's not happening. Um, right. So I I understand why tools like Yammer ought to exist, but I have not yet seen it done well, and I don't know if the problem is in the people, or in the processes, or in the technology. I don't know. I just know yeah, that it's not know, smooth. It, it's got that Facebookish thing. I mean, you can like things, and, um, you know, you get that same kind of look and feel, things that, you know, people are familiar with, that even though it's not Facebook, they kind of get it when they when they go in there. Um, you know that's not the not the same when you when you have other solutions like persistent chat. You know there's you show it to them and there's there's a little bit of a, a ramp up for that. Um, you know Yammer kind of kind of does away with that. It, it's got a, a faster adoption, I think. Um, and you can get you know obviously the Yammer client for all your major phones and stuff like that. Just like you can get the Link client. But um, if it, if it were for, if it were me, um, it would be P Chat forever. I love it. P Chat. Persistent chat. Oh, okay, gotcha. Okay, well, um, I, I've I've worked a lot with um, Jabber, XMPP, the the protocol and, and the servers and software a lot in in my day. And I won't hold that against I'm, you. <laughs> I was on the XMPP standards <laughs> foundation. I'll have you know, I edited <laughs> many. Well, that, extensions. that it would be fine if you know people weren't dropping XMPP. I mean, you know, yeah, Link, yeah. Link, Link, I've talked to XMPP uh, organizations, but unfortunately, there really aren't too many of them left. There's Cisco, um, maybe Jive. I don't, I don't know. Yeah, yeah I, I don't it's definitely, to um, <laughs> it's definitely been changing. Um, and I, I stopped paying so much attention to that many, many years ago. But, but it was a thing. And, and the one of the big strengths of that, um, that protocol at the time, and this was. It wasn't. I won't say it's. It was unique, but it was definitely um, a leader. Was persistent chat, and mm -hmm. that's. It's really. It's really beneficial. You know, I use it a lot. Yeah. You know, every day at work. I, I think. I think with the you know the the Facebook um, mentality, I think the whole idea of dedicated um, chat rooms is is you know going by the wayside, and uh, that's sad because I, I really think that they have their place. Yeah. And and it's it's great. Now, can you do this in Link? Can you um, have ad hoc groups where people can create their own rooms and whatever? Or is it more structured? Uh, well, the admin has to create one. No, my my answer to that is it depends. So um, yes, you can do it, assuming that you know the right access rights are are assigned and everything that that people can go in and create ad hoc groups um, you know the way that I typically see it or have people ask me to configure it is there will be some managers that have the ability to create you know rooms and assign who can access those rooms um, the end users don't necessarily have that right but it can be done completely ad hoc by you know uh, management uh, staff it doesn't have to be link administrative staff gotcha Okay. Well, that yeah, that sounds like a very Microsoft thing, you know. Mm -hmm. uh, a lot of flexibility, a lot of you know, um, delegation of administration privileges, stuff like that. So that's good. 
Yeah, and, and it's that, nice so. because it's it's more the, it's more delegation than just delegating different tasks to different administrative staff. It's delegating things all the way down to the end user level. Gotcha. Okay, so let's see. We talked about kind of the architecture of Link, um, and you guys deploy solutions all the time. Mm -hmm. Not not so much on Exchange. So are you are you going into to places and they they already have Exchange and you're integrating Link with it. Yes. I mean, is Exchange Exchange is, is a lot lower growth area, I would think. Yeah, Link is um, you know Link is now a billion dollar a year business for Microsoft. It's uh, it's wow. huge. Um, you know, it's one of their their it's definitely one of their fastest growing um, platforms. Um, I, you know, I, I would never say that Link is slowing down, um, but I, you know, I think there's more adoption going on with Link right now, you know, especially when people see the integration that it has with existing solutions like Exchange and, and SharePoint, and the fact that you can do development and incorporate it into your own line of business applications, um, you know, putting IAM and Presence directly into your application so that you can, you know, quickly uh, spin up a conversation with a user from within that application. Application, but also oh, because okay. it's 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 so you know tightly ingrained within the office suite itself. I mean, you know, you've got I am in presence and chat built right into um, or, or favorites list built into Outlook. You can you can do instant messaging from when within um, Outlook web app. You know, via web client. Um, you know, everything you can you can put presence into SharePoint and Word docs and and all that stuff and. and and, you know, it's a real nice platform to develop on, too. You know, my role at Modality kind of um, is, is across three different groups. Um, first is, obviously, I'm, I'm a, um, a consultant, so I work on designs and deployments and migrations. But we also have um, a division within Modality that does uh, application development based on Link. And we've got some really cool... Uh, applications that sit on top of Link and, and, and provide all kinds of, you know, neat features and functions. And I'm the person responsible for U.S. deployment of those applications. And so one of the things that I'm working on is, um, you know, scripting and automating not only the deployment of that, but some of the day-to-day uh, -day administration of it from an end-user perspective, too. Um, and, and that's been, you know, very popular. But we also have um, a managed services division where if you deploy Link in your organization and then you decide that you really don't have the internal expertise to support it um, or you want, you know, a cost savings, then you can offload that, that support work onto modality. And so one of the things that we do when we take on a new support customer is we do a complete health check of their, their organization. And so I've been working on automating um, a good chunk of that as well as is going in and seeing how do we remediate some of these issues before, you know, day one of, of their support contract where we're actually taking their support calls. So, um, you know, when it comes to Link, we, we pretty much do it all. We can deploy it. We can support it. We can, we can build applications for you on it. Gotcha. So, um, talk to me for a little bit about um, the the phone. I mean, like uh, using Link as your uh, your your telephone system mm -hmm. is is that what what percentage of of Link customers uh, do that, and and how much additional hardware and software is that part? Well, up until um, I would say you know eighteen months ago. Um, we saw a lot of organizations that were putting in all of the features of Link other than Enterprise Voice. And in the last 18 months, we've seen a huge uptick in, um, in deployment of Enterprise Voice. And it, it, it's pretty simple. You can let Link be your entire phone system so that there's not a PBX hanging on the wall. There's no T1 lines coming in. There's uh, you know a SIP trunk. Uh, coming into a gateway in your environment, a, a dedicated link gateway, and then that talks to your link servers. And your users can answer the phone by, you know, clicking a button on their client when it pops up on the screen, or you can use, um, you know, a physical uh, dedicated phone um, that ties into link as well. And, and the nice thing about that is, you know, your, your, uh, your link contacts list becomes your speed dial list and you know your phone shows the the presence of of those people so you know if they're busy or available um, it works really well and and 
we see a lot more organizations now where we where they deploy enterprise voice for link and they may give physical phones to maybe 20 percent of their people you know maybe people that are on the phones a lot or um, you know receptionists or people that are are, are dealing with uh, a lot of you know high volume phones phone calls whereas the end use the the normal end user may just have um, a headset or may mm -hmm. use just the link client on their mobile phone. Um, so there's a lot of cost savings there because physical phones are expensive. And if you only have to deploy physical phones to say 20% of your staff, there's a cost savings there. Um, plus not having a PBX hanging on the wall, you know, tying it into, you know, a solution that you may already have if you already have link or, you know, tying it into being able to uh, click on a, a person within a, Outlook email and instigate a phone call to that person, you know, without having to pick up a physical handset and dial some numbers, you know, being able to, um, you know, click on a phone number on a website and have it dial the number, kind of like Skype does, you know, Skype's had that for quite a while. Um, you can do that in, in Link as well. So it's from a productivity perspective, it makes life so much easier for your end users. There's a little bit of learning curve in that, you know, people are using a headset now instead of a physical handset. Um, but the fact of the matter is, it, it makes life so much easier because it's so um, it's so streamlined into their their kind of workflow with uh, with uh, messaging in general. Um, okay. It, yeah. No, it's I just mean, it easier. And then it, yeah, and then they and then you know email gets uh, stored in Exchange, and of course it works really well there because then you get your voicemail message in an email message with a text transcription of you know, a good chunk of it so you can actually see what the message was about without even listening to it, you know, be able to return that phone call just by clicking on it. Um, it it yeah, works really I, I well. Think I of course, you have, yeah, you have, you have most of the features that you have, you know, from a PBX perspective, you know, um, you know, there's, there's always, you know, some really obscure feature here or there that, that Link doesn't necessarily have, but, you know, it, it's a pretty good PBX replacement for most organizations. I'm just glad they finally put spell check in link. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I'm somewhat of a grammar Nazi too, and uh, it, it works good for me too. I, I've I've been very happy that they do that. Of course, you know the, the problem with it is, is um, you know, I, I deal with technology, and of course, it doesn't know a whole lot of uh, technological terms, but um, um, it does make me look a little smarter. So, what's what's feature parity of, of link the client itself? Um, as compared to every, all those other options around? Um, I would like to say that it's it's the leading client out there from a feature perspective. Um, you know, and, and I know I keep co coming back to, you know, the integration with all the other Microsoft uh, uh, applications, but that's huge. I mean, you don't really un realize um, how nice that is until you have it. You know, how, how you have... Um, you know, you can go into a SharePoint document list and see I am in presence and, and be able to click on it and call somebody or send them a, send them a message or whatever. Um, mm -hmm. you, have, you have, you know, obviously your, your forwarding and transfers and um, you have simul ring. I'm, you know, this, my kind of soapbox uh, topic is I only ever publish a single phone number to anybody, and that is my link number. And if you call that if you call that number, you'll reach me wherever I am because it'll ring my my uh, client on my computer. It'll ring my physical link phone. It'll ring my mobile phone. One number, regardless of where I am, and you're always able to get in touch with me, or you're always able to leave you know a voicemail message, and it all comes into one place. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm, that, I'm, that I'm a huge fan of that. Yeah, and you know you've got delegation. So if you have managers that have assistants, you know they can answer the phone, they can transfer calls, they can kind of intercept call inbound calls and things like that. So you know all of your your nice features that you really like to have, they're all there in Link. And there so, went Pat. Uh, Hold on, he just dropped. Oh, he did. Yep. Do you want to restart things? Or not. See if he comes back. Oh, yep, there you go. I dropped for a second there. Okay, hold on. Let me fix your audio. Your robot. Yeah. Cylon. Cylon. Okay. 
Okay. Yeah, okay. now you're fixed. You may need to restart are we your video. Okay? Are we are we good? I think so. <laughs> okay. I think okay. You'll just need to restart your video. There, there we go. Okay. I see video. Hey, I've been on the whole time this time, Jonathan. La you remember yeah. last week it uh, was not great. Yeah, your video is the best it's been in weeks. Sweet. So anyway, what I would like to talk about next, um, Pat, was mm -hmm. oh management and PowerShell. Um, I know, I mean, you know what we we talk about PowerShell on the show from time to time. Mm -hmm. um, we had who was it? Um, episode two thirty two. It was we had Thomas Kisner on the show, and we talked about some mm -hmm. of this stuff. But it's been a while, um, and I, w I would definitely like to know um, if anything's changed uh, as well. So. Um, Tell us about the um, the administration experience. Um, what you can do with PowerShell, what you can't do with PowerShell. Uh, you know, cool things you've know seen done and that kind of thing. You can do anything in administration with PowerShell and Link. Um, in fact, some of the things that, um, you have to do in PowerShell, um, the control or the management um, user interface in Link is based on Silverlight, and for day to day common administration stuff, you can do most things. Um, but there's quite a bit more stuff, you know, some uh, deeper policy settings and configuration settings and stuff that you have to do uh, in PowerShell. Um, and it, it kind of depends on, on what you need to do. You know, obviously, if you're a small organization and you're just doing IAM and presence and maybe enterprise voice with uh, just a couple of dial plans or whatever, then the, the user interface, what we call the link control panel, um, is going to be is going to be sufficient. But if you're doing, um, you know, if you're in a larger organization and you're doing a lot of complex uh, routing and complex policies and configuration and stuff like that, then, then PowerShell is going to be your friend. And obviously for somebody like myself who, you know, my job title is UC Automation Lead, um, I, I sit in PowerShell all day. So um, I, I think you need to embrace PowerShell when it comes to Link. Um, there's definitely um, um, some advantages to doing it, um, you know, not just from the convenience of being able to do um, um, more complex tasks at one time, but just by the fact that you have to do it for, have to use PowerShell for um, for some administrative tasks. Um, so um, what, what version of Link are, are we on right now, and when was that we, released? We are on Link uh, 2013. It came out um, the tail end of 2012, I think, in November, if I remember correctly. Um, okay. And there's there's updates to that called um, cumulative updates, and the last cumulative update was in January. So we should see a new one anytime now. Cool. So is there um, have there been changes in, in how you manage um, Link with PowerShell? Um, you mean from the different cumulative updates? Um, there, there's well, sometimes a few what things. happens when, when a when a when a company, a, a group when, within Power uh, within Microsoft, uh, they they'll start from either a um, uh, let's, let's I'm trying to trying to think how to phrase this uh, politely. Um, they, they'll they'll either they'll either start with a um, a comprehensive API. Which they attach to, you know, a .NET interface or whatever, and it allows them to do pretty much anything. Or mm -hmm. they use a really old API, which is really hard to use and awkward and has strange caveats. Um, or they're making some abstraction layer, and what happens with that is that you can only touch, you know, like like twenty percent of of you know you know so so the scope of it is small and it, and it gets bigger over time. Now you've said that you can do anything um, with PowerShell and even more. That there's things you have to do in PowerShell, but was it always that way? Yeah, yeah, it's it's always been that way. Um, you can do absolutely everything in a, from a link perspective within PowerShell, and I've I've come up with essentially seven areas in which. Um, I use PowerShell. Um, the first is environment assessment. So a lot of people may have, have had this happen in their organization where they've had Microsoft come in and do uh, an AD risk assess a risk assessment program or, or an ad wrap or an exchange uh, wrap. Um, same thing. You know, you, you want to look at the overall environment health. 
And so you can do that um, even before you deploy Link, or let's say you have a legacy version of maybe Office Communication Server 2007 R2, and you want to upgrade uh, to Link 2013. So an environment assessment is is real good. You know, part of a a, a comprehensive health check before you mm-hmm. even start touching anything. You're going in and you're looking at everything. Is you know is the schema um, right? You know, forest prep, domain prep, or you know, how is that? What's your functional level of your forest and your domain? And um, you know, are there any obvious issues there with Active Directory? How are your groups set up? Things like that. Then you've got um, your environment prep, and that's when you go through and actually do things like the schema extensions for the next version, or in a greenfield deployment, you know, the new schema uh, updates and the forest and domain prep. Um, and, th- and those are pretty straightforward. The, the environment assessment can be fairly complex, and for the usual, for the average person who works within an organization supporting that organization. Um, they don't necessarily do that, but us, you know, as as somebody who comes in as a consultant and needs to take a, an in-depth look in a relatively short period of time, that PowerShell really comes into play there. Not necessarily link specific at that point, but we're looking at the overall environment health. And then, and then after environment prep, then you've got your server prep. And this is where I've spent a lot of time using PowerShell. Um, I can take a uh, a server that's handed to me, a, a normal domain join uh, server, and I can spit out um, a server at the other end that's completely ready for link. You know, it's got all the prerequisites done, all the Windows features, SQL Express installed, you know, anything that needs to be done. Um, and, and that, to me, is where a lot of the work um, really takes place. Um, I, you know, I've got one script that's got 3,000 lines just to prep a server so you can install a link on it. Wow, you need um, to wow. start looking at PowerShell DSC, my man. <laughs> <laughs> well, the, the, prob- the problem with DSC is I have to look at lowest common denominator for the client environments that we come across. Oh, uh, sure. And, and so um, I, I drew the line in that my prereq script requires server 2012. Um, I, I don't deal with 2008 R2 from a from a prereq script perspective, um, just because I, I need at least PowerShell 3.0, and um, it's pretty popular. It's you know it's a public script that's out there on my blog, and and it's been used to deploy over a half a million seats in Link. Um, and then next, you've got your server install. You know, obviously with Link, there's there's an install GUI that you can go through and go through all these steps. But some people are are taking that to the to the next step and automating that from a from a PowerShell perspective and just doing all the commands right there, um, and and taking it right from the ser- the prereq stage through the installation of Link and bringing it online. And that's really nice. Again, for organizations that, or for people that are in organizations supporting those organizations and they don't have a pile of servers, that's probably a little more work than, than what they really need to do. But then after that, now you've got environment config, so you've got all your servers spun up, and now you've got to start configuring thing, you, things. You need to start you know, uh, with your dial plans and your voice policies and your normalization rules and your client policies and all that. And that stuff is real easy to configure, say, from a CSV file where you just have a, a file full of policy information, and you just loop through it and create all these policies. It's real nice. And then obviously you've got your monitoring perspective. You know, we can use um, SCOM in a lot of environments, in most environments we see. But you can use Link to do a lot of monitoring from a server health perspective and, and, um, you know, and and all that, making sure that we're not running into resource contention and, and making sure services are running and automating some synthetic tests to make sure that most of the features are, are up and running. And if they're not, that we get an alert, um, you know, letting us know that there's a problem. And then the last stage is administration. And in a lot of larger uh, organizations, we see this really taking off with onboarding and offboarding of, of users. So, you know, somebody hires an, a new employee, a script runs, provisions them for link, assigns all the right policies, you know, assigns them a, a, a DID phone number and the right policies for that. And so that, you know, on day one, um, you know, they log into Link for the first time, and they're they're all configured, and really nothing, you know. An admin didn't have to touch anything on the back end. It was just a script that runs in the background, and it makes life a lot easier. So you can, 
you can automate the heck out of out of link and um, and really not have to touch it unless something's wrong or unless you're making a change. We we do have a couple of questions in the chat room. One of them is from uh, Steve Morawski, and he said that um, he it's his understanding that Link uses implicit remoting, uh, that type of model, like the way that Exchange does, and he's wondering if there's any gotchas with running the implicit remoting commands. Um, not really that I've seen. Um, it works pretty well. The, the one thing you run into with some remoting, with PS remoting or anything, is that the edge servers typically sit in your perimeter network. They're not domain joined. So um, you, you do run into some issues where you, you have to specify credentials in order to run commands on those servers. But um, otherwise, stuff just normally works. It's real nice. There is a ton of commandlets to use in, in Link. In fact, I, I wrote a spreadsheet just to keep track of all the different uh, commandlets that are available and when they got introduced because I think there's more commandlets to use in Link than there is in any other product in Microsoft. It's, uh, it, it's insane. But um, no, to answer the question, I, I'm not aware of any, any huge gotchas. Um, it, I, I, I'm able to do just about anything I need to do. Yeah, I remember on um, I think it's SharePoint where there are things that you can only do when you're you know interactively on the on the system, not not interactively, but you have to do just strange uh, the way that you connect to the um, to its API. Was it STS admin? I think is the the entry point. Yeah, I you, from a link perspective, it's it's generally pretty easy. I mean, you can do pretty much anything from just about anywhere. Um, the the caveat that I've seen is that um, some commands require you to run them on a machine that has a local instance, uh, like the RTC local instance on it. So if you, have, um, if you have a management server that doesn't have an RTC local instance, then some things like your synthetic tests may fail because it can't query a local instance. Um, but, but other than that, it, stuff pretty much works fairly easily. Now, another question that we have from the chat room is, from a client perspective, can you actually send link messages from PowerShell? So there used to be a way to do it, but you had to have the SDK installed. Okay. And to, to install the SDK and to get that working is a, is a pain in the rear. Um, it's, it's really a pain. And I've, really? I've long, yeah, it's, because you know this, the SDK has like all these prerequisites that you have to install before you can even install the SDK, and um, for the most part, I find that to be um, more trouble than it's worth. Hmm. Um, but, That's too bad. But you can, yeah, you can do it, and and people are coming out with some ways to kind of help streamline that a little bit. Um, you know, there's there's people that have come out with some scripts now that allow you to manipulate your presence settings as well. Um, from within PowerShell, but sending out um, uh, messages is still, in my opinion, is, is still problematic. Do you do most of your setups for customers? Are they all on-prem? And we just lost him. <laughs> it's like you guys are taking turns, dropping off. Whoop. Are okay. you back? Try that. Yeah, I'm back. Try that again. Okay. Uh, the, the question I have is, do you do most of your installations on-prem, or all of your installations on-prem, or do you do some in uh, Microsoft's cloud or other cloud providers? Uh, we do almost everything on-prem. Okay. Now, with Microsoft's kind of focus on cloud first and the fact that they do hosted Exchange and hosted Link, are you seeing from your perspective the benefits of that because they're at least some of their stuff like Azure they're iterating all the time right they're they're constantly making improvements uh, right. to the cloud software and then eventually the the on-prem software gets that have you started to see that trickling down into the on-prem stuff or or is there still pretty much parity between what Microsoft's providing in the cloud and what we have on-premises um, no on-prem is still 
still the better way to go. Um, okay. You you cannot do enterprise voice in Office in native Office three sixty five. Yeah, um, that makes sense. You can do um, Office three uh, link online, you know, part of Office three sixty five, um, and do everything but enterprise voice. And then when you just decide that you want enterprise voice, you have a couple of of options. You can do a hybrid scenario where you have some users on prem, and those users can be voice enabled, and users in the cloud are not voice enabled. Um, you can also do something where all of your users are in the cloud, and you use a third party solution to do the enterprise voice component. And, and we're starting to see a lot of partners pop up in that space. Eventually, I think we're going to see um, enterprise voice as a feature built into Office 365. We saw it for a while, um, and, and they kind of pulled that back. But we'll, we'll see it again eventually. Um, my concern is, do you really want to put your business um, telephony solution you know, on the other side of an internet connection. What <laughs> happens if that internet connection goes down? You know, the phone, the phone stops ringing. Right. And, you know, if you're in a sales business or anything like that, that, that starts to hurt really quick. Now, obviously, for the most part, a lot of organizations have fairly stable connections. But, you know, do you really want that out there? I, I, I'm kind of mixed on that. You know, of course... I'm somewhat biased because, you know, I'm, I'm a billable consultant that goes out and does on-prem on deployments, and it's a lot different when you're doing uh, a link online deployment. There's a lot less uh, involved there. Um, a lot of organizations, I think, will always do on-prem deployments, you know, anything government-related, anything uh, financial-related, um, anything like that. I think they'll always stay on-prem versus, you know, hybrid or full cloud deployments. Yeah, I mean, it, it makes sense, especially if you're trying to do uh, all the voice integration that you wouldn't be able to do that if yep. you're, you're hosted in the cloud. Yeah. What sort of integration do you see in the future between Link and Skype? I know that Microsoft has kind of been talking about that on and off. I've heard Mary Jo Foley talk about it on and off for like the last two years or ever since they bought Skype. They've been talking about the the eventual the eventual integration of those two platforms. Where do you think Microsoft is going with that? Well, we've already seen uh, where um, some of the Skype codec stuff has been integrated into Link. Um, we've already seen where you can communicate back and forth with Skype users from an instant messaging perspective, and now you can do in, in some scenarios do um, audio calls. Uh, peer-to-peer audio calls. I think uh, in the not-too-distant future, and that being within the next year, I think we'll start to see, um, you know, audio-video calls peer-to-peer. Um, I think it's going to be a little bit longer before we start to see multi-party stuff. Um, but but who knows? Um, you know, now that the fact that they're starting to roll some of the, you know, kind of settle on some combined codecs, I, I think we'll start to see faster um, feature parity between the two. Um, I think they'll always be uh, separate products. I think Skype is, you know, a great consumer product. I think Link is a perfect com um, uh, commercial product. Um, but I think we're going to see a lot more uh, integration between the two of them here pretty soon. What about the, the Link client on all the different platforms. I know that they've got, you know, they've got a link client for Android. They've got, I'm sure they have one for iOS. Do they have one, like, can you put an Xbox? Is there a, a link client for Xbox the way there is with Skype? Uh, no, not yet. Okay. Um, there are some third-party products that let you do stuff on, like, Linux. You can do um, Pigeon. You can connect a link via Pigeon on uh, Linux boxes. Um, you know, there's a, a client for all your major mobile devices. Uh, I'm a huge fan of the client on the uh, iPad. It's a beautiful client. Um, you know, Windows Phone, all the iOS stuff, Android. Recently, they came out with the Android tablet client. Um, so they've covered, I think, a, a good chunk of what's out there. I'd love to see a full Xbox client. I'd love to, you know, go down into my living room and use my 60-inch LED TV as a, as a link client. That would be fabulous. Um, I, I think we'll see that probably sooner than later. Or even in conference rooms, I could see that being yeah. useful. Well, you know, the, the big thing now is uh, Link Room System um, came out, you know, within the last year where... Oh, I haven't um, heard of that. Is that 
like does that compete with the Cisco stuff? Yeah, it's very it's yes, um, it, and it's beautiful. We uh, we had one at my previous employer where it had uh, dual seventy inch screens. Um, it was beautiful. It had a, a real nice camera. You could do whiteboarding and and um, you know a little tablet that sat on the table that gave you control over pretty much everything. You could connect a desktop to it and share out applications and things like that. Um, you could invite the room to meetings and then just walk in and with one touch on the on the tablet join that meeting and have everything spin up for it. Um, it's it's a great solution. And we're starting to see more vendors with, you know, Polycom and Smart and everybody that are, are coming out with uh, uh, link room systems that uh, are sometimes cheaper than a lot of the Cisco solutions. Yeah, that doesn't surprise me. The Cisco stuff yeah. is usually really expensive. So yeah, it's not, we'll, it's we'll not like see. it's not a Microsoft branded solution. It's something that Microsoft provides that third parties can build out hardware for. Is that right? Okay. Yeah, it's all it's all third party hardware. Um, with uh, a link client on it that's that's um, you know dedicated to the link room system. Cool. And we're starting to see. Well, actually, we have seen you know some discussions and some work towards getting um, legacy Cisco equipment to connect to link as well. And there have been some uh, you know announcements and discussions where. Um, in the not too distant future, there might be another component to Link that will allow those Cisco devices to connect as as somewhat of a, a Link client themselves, so they appear as as a regular um, endpoint within Link, and and that that's going to be really big, I think, because that's going to allow organizations to, you know, further their um, a return on investment of that legacy equipment by allowing it to connect to Link, and in some organizations, that that's a huge um, a roadblock for organizations that are thinking about moving to Link. Is you know they have you know a considerable amount of money tied up into uh, video systems that are dedicated to to uh, Cisco or Polycom. Yeah, we have that problem where you know we may have we have Cisco you know their telepresence where you've got the two screens side by side and you can display on one screen you can see you know another room on the other screen but then we have people who are joining via link and they can't see any of that all they can see right. is is what is being shared on you know share your desktop on link and it'd be much better to have all of that stuff integrated it'd be a much better experience for for the at least for the people on link yeah I, all, all I can say without uh, getting into too much trouble is, is I think we'll see that eventually. Yeah, I think we need to. That'd be really good. Yeah. Well, hey, Pat, um, the, I, before we let you go, I wanted to give you a chance to um, uh, you know, tell us where we can hear more uh, about what you do. And I, I know you've got a podcast, so why don't you mention that real quick? Sure. So I'm uh, one of the hosts, along with uh, Steve Goodman, who's an Exchange MVP. Uh, we are the hosts of the UC Architects podcast, and it's a group of 15 people, 13 of which are uh, either Exchange or Link MVPs, and two of which are um, Link or Exchange uh, masters. And we get together every couple of weeks and do a podcast uh, about you know what's happening with uh, Link and Exchange and Office 365 and just a wee bit of Skype. Um, and you can check us out on theucarchitects.com, and the podcast is available on uh, the Zoom Marketplace and uh, iTunes and RSS and all that fancy stuff. So, um, you know, we have special guests on, people from the Exchange and Link product groups and things like that. So we talk about, you know, what's happening and, and issues that people have, have come across and reviews of products and things like that. So, you know, stop by. We get uh, several thousand people to download every episode. So uh, we're doing good there. Um, for us at Modality, you can check us out at uh, modalitysystems.com. And uh, if you have any questions about, you know, deploying Link or you need somebody to help you or do the design or you need somebody to support it or you need some applications done, Modality Systems is the place to go. So you have 15 people on your podcast? Did they like well, rotate in? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. The thing is, is it's it's fifteen people. Um, they're all over the world. 
So getting, uh, you know, a bunch of people together to do one of the episodes is like herding cats. Oh, sure. So, um, you know, we typically get, you know, four to six people that are available on any given weekend to, uh, to jump in. And, you know, like I said, we occasionally have guests. We've had, um, you know, Greg Taylor from uh, the Exchange Product Group and, um, you know, some people from, from Link and everything. So, um, yeah, it's, and, you know, of course, everybody's, you know, there's always people on vacation and things like that. So it's usually between four and six or eight people that uh, are in each episode. Yeah, that that sounds really reasonable. And then you can pick and, on the people who aren't there. Yeah, <laughs> yeah and some of the people, um, you know, do more work behind the scenes, whether it's, um, you know, editing or content submission or reviews or things like that. So um, it, it works out really well. And uh, we've been very fortunate. We've, like I said, we get, um, we've had 10,000 downloads of some of our episodes. And, uh, right on. You know, it's 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 nice because we love to talk about this stuff. We like to talk about, you know, things we've come across and help other people. And people submit questions, and we try to answer them. And we try to talk about products and events, and and just you know, not everybody can go to the Link conference, or not everybody can can buy you know five thousand dollars worth of various equipment just to test it out and review it and figure out what's best. So we we try to do that for them. That's awesome. Yeah, it's yep. a lot of fun. I love it. Definitely. And you are, uh, what is this? It's Pat Richard on uh, Twitter. Anything yep, else you want to... Pat Richard. Yep, and my blog is uh, eloworld.com, E-H-L-O world.com, and that's where you can get uh, a whole slew of uh, Exchange and Link uh, scripts for uh, deployment and administration and, and things like that. Awesome. Well, before we let you go, there's one other question we want to ask you, and this is sure. something that we ask of everybody who comes on the podcast. So, Pat Richard, what we would like to know is if you could be a superhero or have a superpower, who would it be and why? Um, I would be Superman, and the reason why is because my four-year-old grandson lives with us, and he likes to be Batman, and, uh, you know, the, the, the two superheroes together would be awesome. I wouldn't even need any of the, the, the normal powers. I could just be Superman and just be cool with my little buddy. Nice. Good one. Superman yeah, is it. the most common... Well, I'm trying to remember. I think it was... Yeah, I think it's the... I think it was Superman first and then Batman. Yep. Hmm. But we've had a wide range. So, Pat, thank you very much for coming and uh, hanging out with us. Um, hope that you had a good time. I know we did in our... Our listeners will see all the, uh, we'll put a lot, of, a lot of links in the show notes uh, for things you pointed us to. Great. Well, thanks for having me on. Our pleasure. All right. So, uh, appreciate it, Pat. And um, the audio recorded version will get posted to the website, uh, you know, in several days when, when uh, Jonathan has time to do the editing part. And I guess the video will be up instantaneously, sort of, right, Jonathan? Yes. It will be up still, right away. Still getting used. And then I'll have to, you know, cut off the beginning part. Yeah. When I was getting set up. Um, sounds like you got a, quite a successful podcast there. That's awesome. Is he still on? Yeah, he's still yeah, on. Yeah, I'm, I'm still here. Sorry, oh, okay. I was muted. Sorry. Um, yeah, we we love it. It started out as just kind of a pet project, and it's 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 grown. I mean, now we've got a lot of recognition from vendors and and the big companies and Microsoft. We get a lot of support from Microsoft now. Yeah, they've been really Excellent. good for us too. They, they've been great about that. It is pretty cool to to have that that venue and you know where you can do that. So great. Well, um, I've got to sign off. I know Jonathan wanted to get uh, get going as well. Um, but thanks again, Pat, and uh, hopefully we'll uh, talk to you again or see you at a conference soon. Sure. My pleasure. All right. Good night, everybody. Good night, everybody.